You remember, all of that presence of the IEA there, what you would get would be, of course, as you could expect in a war, conflicting, contradictory narratives, where Ukraine was saying something, the Russians would say exactly the opposite, and vice versa. And that, as if by magic, stopped altogether. Why? Well, it was not magic, it's because now the IEA is there. That's the voice of Rafael Grossi, Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plash Race Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Tom Colina and Lauren Billet. Thanks, Alex, and welcome back to Press the Button. Lauren, great to see you. Exciting week last week for Plowshares Fund. Hi, Tom. Great to see you, too. Yes, last week was a lot of fun, and it was great to be able to see you and our fellow colleagues in person. What did we do last week? Last week, we hosted our annual nuclear policy forum titled Press the Button Live Nuclear Policy in Crisis. It was a hybrid event that was hosted live in D.C. and on Zoom. And it featured remarks from IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi, former President of Ireland Mary Robinson, Mallory Stewart from the State Department, and Senator Elizabeth Warren, as well as two fantastic panels, one of which you hosted, Tom. Do you want to tell us more about that? Sure, Lauren. Thanks. Yeah, I hosted the Nuclear Futures panel with Barbara Slavin at the Atlantic Council, Esther M. at Foreign Policy for America, and Michael Lewis with Navajo Nation. We talked about the Iran nuclear deal, North Korea's nuclear program, and the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act. It was a terrific conversation. We also had a fabulous panel on Ukraine with Plowshares Fund board member Ben Rhodes, Mariana Bujarin from Harvard, and Scott Sagan at Stanford. I would say the whole event reflected the many challenges we now face on nuclear policy issues, but also the many opportunities we have to create a safer world. Yes, that was a theme throughout the entire event on how many opportunities we have in front of us. So thank you, Tom, for leading that amazing conversation. But anyways, for listeners, if you missed the event, a recording will be available on our website at plowsharesfund.org if you would like to take a look. But Tom, back to you. What do you have for us this week on the nuclear front? Well, thanks, Lauren. You know, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un gave a whole new meaning to bring your kid to work day by bringing his daughter to a missile launch. And this was not just any missile launch. On Friday, Kim oversaw the launch of the country's largest intercontinental ballistic missile, the Hwasong-17, which is thought to be powerful enough to loft multiple nuclear warheads far across the globe. North Korea already has ballistic missiles that can reach the U.S. mainland, but this would be the first that could do so with more than one warhead and greater ability to evade U.S. defenses. As I mentioned, Kim watched the test alongside his daughter, who has never appeared in public before. South Korea says that Mr. Kim and his wife, Ri Sol Ju, have three children, but North Korea has never confirmed it. On other news, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin painted a bleak picture for the world over the weekend at the Halifax International Security Forum, saying that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could start a race for nuclear weapons. Referring to dictators like Russia's President Putin, the secretary said, quote, they could well conclude that getting nuclear weapons would give them a hunting license of their own, and that could drive a dangerous spiral of nuclear proliferation, unquote. And then, of course, there's the other side of the equation, where non-nuclear states like Ukraine could learn the lesson that they need nuclear weapons to keep themselves safe from invasion. So many unfortunate consequences of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Finally, the UN's nuclear watchdog on Thursday passed a resolution censuring Iran for not cooperating with the agency's investigation into traces of uranium found at three undeclared sites in Iran. The resolution passed with 26 votes in favor and two votes against, coming significantly from Russia and China. The UN passed a similar resolution in June, and at that time, Iran retaliated by limiting the monitoring and verification regime set up by the Iran nuclear deal. Talks to revive that deal are still on hold. Lauren, what do you have set up for us on Press the Button? This week, we're bringing listeners a snippet of Plowshares Fund President Dr. Emma Belcher's conversation with IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi, which was originally aired during last week's Press the Button live event. 
And it's a fascinating conversation regarding Ukraine and Iran and more. So stay tuned. And if you like what you hear, please remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback, as always, helps us improve the show. And with that, let's get into the episode. The clock is ticking. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi. Director General Grossi has been head of the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, since 2019. He is a diplomat with over 35 years of experience in the field of nonproliferation and disarmament. In 2013, he was appointed ambassador of Argentina to Austria and Argentine representative to the IAEA. Since 2017, Director General Grossi has been an international gender champion promoting gender balance in the nuclear field. Welcome, Director General Grossi. Thank you very much, Emma. It's a great pleasure to, to be with you. Looking forward to our conversation. So let's start by setting the stage. The IAEA has gained significant public prominence recently. Can you help the audience understand the significance of the IAEA? Well, I would say the the IAEA is one of the oldest, I would say, agencies in the international system, founded in 1957. And it's an agency that has a very, I would say, a wide mandate. People may identify it more with its nuclear watchdog role in non-proliferation. We are a big inspectorate, so we send inspectors to every country that is a member and has some nuclear activity. So that is one very visible part in particular, since uh, we started having, we, I say collectively, we uh, internationally started having some proliferation situations in the world, especially in the Middle East, then in other parts of the world as well, in the Korean Peninsula and other parts. So the IAEA started appearing more and more as an organization having a very important role in terms of international peace and security. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you've conducted multiple safeguards visits at nuclear power sites in Ukraine. Notably, you visit the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in September. Now, when you take a role at the IAEA, I assume you don't expect other duties as assigned to include visiting a nuclear power plant in the throes of a war, in a war zone. So how did you prepare yourself and your staff to go in? And what was it like to experience the shelling in and around Zaporizhia in person? What you say, um, it's true. We, we were not and could not expect this, this situation. Um, uh, the, the, the need for us to work uh, in, in, in war, under war conditions, it's something that was, was of course, uh, never imagined. Um, there were war wars before in, in places where the IEA could have acted, but the situation never lent itself for, for that. This time I felt that we had to be present and very present from day one. Which, which we did. Uh, Saporizia, you are mentioning, uh, but don't forget that we went to Chernobyl as well. At, at the beginning, um, immediately after the withdrawal of the Russian occupation forces there back in March. So um, in terms of Saporizia, we, um, first of all, it was in, in very, very difficult to prepare the, and to get all the, all the conditions, preconditions, and, and uh, uh, pre-negotiations ready, enabled to go there, because um, you could do that, of course, uh, proceeding from Russian territory, but this is something we decided that we would not do, since uh, this is a Ukrainian facility, and we didn't want to acquiesce or recognize in any way through our presence this de facto situation. So getting to that required many rounds of negotiations. I was in Antalya with the Russians and with the, then in Kaliningrad, then in, in Kiev many, many times. So the, the uh, having the uh, agreement on both sides and also the support from the United Nations Department Safety and security provides the armored 
vehicles for us and some support in terms of uh, security experts was very difficult. We were on the verge of getting it in June. That was frustrated for other reasons. And then finally, we were able to put it together for the time we went there. But there were difficulties all over the way, including last minute problems um, before, before getting uh, there. Uh, we were stopped at checkpoints and then we were shot at. Uh, as simple as that, me and my team, uh, when uh, crossing the gray zone um, that separates the last um, Ukrainian checkpoint from the first Russian checkpoint. So it was a war zone. I don't think that um, IAEA experts or any international experts, uh, for that matter, were uh, ever uh, doing their job um, in, in, a, in a war zone and in a combat zone. So that was pretty uh, difficult, but the team was, was well prepared uh, for that, very motivated to do what we were um, about to do. In terms of the substance of what we needed to do, we were very clear. Um, we should not forget that Saporizia is a place we know very well. Uh, we, we visited the, and we have been inspecting Saporizia um, since it was um, established. Um, so, um, we knew exactly what to look for, where to look, what were the things that were relevant uh, in our work. We also needed to do some um, uh, observ general observation and stock taking of the situation because um, shelling had started actually in earnest in August. So, we, we wanted to check some of the damage. You may have seen some footage or photos of me surrounded by a number of people, Ukrainian and Russian, um, and some of my team uh, inspecting and looking at, uh, at those places. Uh, so uh, that, that mission was important in that regard. Secondly, it was very important because that allowed me to do another first in safeguards history and in safety and security history, which was to establish a permanent presence, an outpost, if you want, of the IAEA there, initially with two experts. And now, after the first rotation, we enlarged it to four experts from the agency who are there every day. They are the ones checking, assisting as well, the management there with some uh, security and safety issues and providing the world through the almost daily updates that the IEA has been publishing with accurate reports of what is happening. If you remember, before that presence of the IEA there, what you would get would be, of course, as you could expect in a war, conflicting, contradictory narratives, where Ukraine was saying something, the Russians would say exactly the opposite, and vice versa. And that, as if by magic stopped altogether. Why? Well, it was not magic. It's because now the IEA is there and the IEA is saying what is happening. We had cases where there were attempts to put press statements alleging that something was happening when it was not. And we immediately set the record straight. That was important. Well, speaking of some of those claims that were put forward by sort of Russia and maybe Ukraine and the role of the IAEA, Maybe we can talk specifically about Russia's recent claims that Ukraine might be constructing a dirty bomb. So first off, can you explain for some in our audience who might not be aware, what, what is a dirty bomb exactly? And what is the IAEA's role in assessing the claim that Russia has made? So a dirty bomb is an artifact which contains normal conventional explosives. It also contains radioactive material just to be dispersed. It's not to be confused with a nuclear weapon. It's not a nuclear weapon. It is just a device that contains material, nuclear material, radioactive material, which after the explosion will be dispersed, be it ammunition or shell or whatever, in whatever form or missile that is supposed to spread radioactivity, radioactive material to cause uh, some damage, but um, it is assessed that by military experts also that its uh, effectiveness is measured in terms of the panic 
it creates because of course in any you know population uh, the uh, idea of an, a projectile coming with nuclear material which could be dispersed and contaminate and, and, and many other things is of course and legitimately so a source of enormous enormous concern so going back to now this is for the explanation of a dirty bomb but coming to specifically what happened and what we have been doing uh, the russian uh, minister of defense um, a couple of uh, weekends ago took the unusual step of calling his uh, colleagues from the united kingdom france and the united states to say that they had um, solid intelligent intelligence information indicating that uh, on two places later on a third one was added um, uh, there was either production of certain isotopes uh, of uh, of uh, some nuclear material uh, cesium and strontium in particular um, which were being prepared uh, for dispersion inside a dirty bomb so uh, of course and what was more uh, concerning i would say was the fact that this fact was mentioned as one which could trigger the possible use of nuclear weapons in defense uh, your audience um, perhaps knows that for usage of nuclear weapons uh, there are certain doctrines and principles that uh, guide uh, this uh, this use of, of the nuclear weapon in, in every nuclear weapon state. And one coincidence in general, uh, in, in these conditions, in these boxes that must be checked, is that a country uh, is attacked with a nuclear device. So the assertion um, was that being attacked with a, even a dirty bomb could justify the use of nuclear weapons. Of course, this was extremely of extreme concern. We, I was personally approached by some international uh, leaders uh, asking what and if the IAEA could do something about it. And then, of course, uh, the answer could have been yes or, or no, um, because in principle, the use of dirty bombs, one could argue, is something that is maybe not part of a normal. But what we thought was that we could do something about it by discussing with our Ukrainian uh, colleagues the possibility of them inviting us to perform um, an inspection or inspections at these places which had been identified by Russia as the sources, possible sources, of the material for the, for the dirty bombs. I say this in this way because the IEA, as you may imagine, as an international independent organization, does not perform inspections at the request of a country or just because a country says that another country has something or is doing something. But in this case, given the fact that there is a war, given the fact that there was uh, the, this narrative of possibly involving nuclear weapons in this equation, we felt that we had to think a little bit out of the box and try to be uh, proactive in, in our approach in, of course, we could not prevent the use of a weapon of any sort, but by diffusing, diffusing, cooling off through inspection, this scenario that was being presented. So uh, uh, luckily, the, the, the Ukrainian government agreed uh, to that. So um, a, a request, a request was made to me to send the inspectors. And we sent inspectors to these two places. One is a research and development 
facility near Kiev. The second um, is a mine, so less perhaps relevant in terms of the direct um, processing of nuclear material to get to these isotopes I mentioned before. As our audience knows, we are recording this before we'll actually be showing it. So by the time people see this interview, they will know the results of that investigation. And thank you so much for doing that. Now, if we could just pivot to Iran, because this is something that I'm, our audience, uh, a lot of people have been very involved in this. Talks to return to the Iran nuclear deal have been put on pause, particularly in light of the Iranian government's crackdown on ongoing protests for freedoms. If the deal is eventually saved, how hard will it be for the IAEA to reaffirm the status of Iran's nuclear program? It will be complex. Uh, and it, it, it has been made complex. Uh, it was always going to be difficult, but now it has been made more complex. Why I say this? I say this because a few months ago, um, 27 cameras uh, belonging to us, uh, which perform uh, inspection by remotely taking uh, footage of certain places and facilities and equipment were disconnected uh, by, by Iran. Uh, some other online measurement uh, systems were interrupted. So as a result of that, we have lost um, a lot of uh, visibility in terms of what has been going on. So uh, if uh, the JCPOA is revived, restored, um, I'm not saying it's impossible, and I have said also if, even in my, my reports to the Board of Governors, uh, we will require or we will have to sit down with our Iranian counterparts to set out a number of measures to try to reconstruct some of the activities um, that we could have had on tape, but not anymore, um, and, and, and to look into the inventories of material in some places and, and parts of um, assembly parts of uh, centrifuges, which is basically the type of uh, places my cameras were, were observing. So, of course, uh, as IAEA, uh, we provide a, a service, in this case, a non-proliferation service, if I can put it in these almost commercial terms. Um, and, and what is essential is that, that we can provide this um, this service, if you want, this guarantee, this credible assurance, as we say in the technical terminology, that uh, nothing has happened or is happened which is escaping the eye of the inspectors. Uh, so this is why many people are, uh, are concerned about our ability to do that, because how do you, uh, in JCPOA, participant country um, get back into the agreement signed on the dotted line if you cannot get from the IAEA a guarantee that everything is on the table and that you are making your calculations of what is there and what is not there and what is limited and what is not limited on the basis of reality. So this is why I say complex but not impossible. So in this difficult and unprecedented time, what keeps you hopeful? I would say uh, we, we must be professionally hopeful and optimistic in the sense that we cannot be starry-eyed or naive in our approaches, but we must continue to believe that with the tools that we have in our hands, we can do something to stabilize the situation and hopefully even contribute to the restoration of peace there. As you know, and this was part of what I, what I was alluding in the beginning, I am trying to get to establish a nuclear safety and security protection zone around the Zaporizhian nuclear power plant. 
which is, in my opinion, indispensable in order to mitigate the risk of a major nuclear radiological accident over there. And I have been in negotiation with Russia. I was talking about this with President Vladimir Putin. And I was talking about this, of course, on several occasions to President Volodymyr Zelensky. So this is a concrete area where we are trying to get uh, something or at least significantly mitigate the risk of of an interaction. Well, DG Grossi, thank you so much for joining us for Press the Button Live. Thank you for the critical work that you and your team do. And thank you for being present and very present, as you said, during the Ukraine crisis. It's a really challenging time. It's a scary time. And having an organisation at you at the helm who thinks outside the box, who provides a cooling off function, who says yes rather than no, thank you from so many people watching today and I know around the world you perform an essential service and uh, best of luck as we go through this moving forward. Thank you very much. I thank you uh, for the work of educational work, work on uh, informing um, uh, audiences uh, in the United States and all over the world about this important work, not only of ours, the important and topical issues related to non-proliferation, nuclear weapons, and uh, international peace and security at large. So I take you and I see you as partners in in this uh, important, indispensable work of the day. I thank you very much for that. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Lauren Billett, Angela Kellett, and Alex Hall. Audio engineering in San Francisco by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is by Leo Spawn and Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based band 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.